Robbie Tobiak played 14 years in the NFL, and he is a member of the Seahawks' 35th anniversary team. Uh, he played in two Super Bowls. Robbie, uh, before we get to your NFL career, I want to talk high school because from where you started to where you are, where you finished uh, in the Super Bowls, Newport Ritchie High School in Tarpon Springs, Florida, a school with only a flag football team until your senior year. <laughs> How did you get from there to the Super Bowl? Uh, well, <laughs> a lot of want to. Um, you know, I, I'd grown up. I'd started playing football in like fourth grade um, and had played you know, all the way through, I love the sport, love the game, got to high, got to high school. And I went to, you know, Newport Richie Christian there and, and it was a small school and they, they didn't have a football team, but the promise was every year they were going to get one. And, uh, but we had a strong basketball team. So I really got into basketball and through basketball, uh, I really, uh, playing as much basketball as I did. I think it, it helped me develop, helped me develop the footwork I needed and those types of things. Uh, so then when we did get that football team, uh, you know, I was a better athlete and my instincts kind of came back quickly and, and, uh, you know, th through all that, you know, I ended up meeting Jack Thompson and, and a lot of people know the story that he, uh, he, I saw him at a basket, charity basketball game and the, the pro athlete team only had five guys show up and they were kind of went, they were going to get winded because <laughs> it was all former athletes, you know, they yeah. in, in great shape. So, so they asked me if I'd play at high tops, the guys they were playing knew me. I knew I could play, and uh, and through that, Jack said, you know, hey, well, where are you going to school? What are you doing? And I, I said, well, I want to play football in college, you know, and I'm talking to some small schools right now, and, and he started helping me and working with me, and uh, I'll never forget it. He told me, you know, <clears throat> hey, listen, Tobek, you know, I'm not going to babysit your ass, but if you show me you're willing to work, I'll help you. And cool. I said, yes, sir. And uh, so, I, you know, I showed him I was willing to work and do what it took, and and we made this goofy video and he sent it around and I ended up at junior college in, in Texas. And from there, he, uh, he pestered Coach Price enough that he was willing to give me a scholarship to Washington State. When you, when you say you made a goofy video, like were you showing linemen, like you blocking, like how do you make, what was the video about? Well, you know, in high school I played running back. So, you know, I was 200 pounds. I wasn't, I wasn't a lineman. So what we did, I did, but I didn't have a lot of film. Again, first year for football team there at that school, and this is the 80s. Uh, so, the, the, you know, the film wasn't there. And so we had to sh do something to show that, you know, this guy's not a stiff. Uh, so we, we went to a gym. And, uh, you know, Jack had kind of said, well, this guy, kid, you know, he's got a chance to be a tight end, you know. So he, he threw me the ball. I ran some routes. He threw me the ball. And then I did a dunk video. And so I'm, I'm literally just sitting there, just doing different dunks and throwing the ball off the backboard and, and uh, the you know, football, the, 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 the we, basketball. Well, you know, no. So I grabbed so, the basketball. Yeah. So you were doing. So when you're talking about this this film inside a gym, he was throwing you passes, football passes, right? Exactly. But then you were doing some dunking as well. Yeah. Like, I, I, you know, once we got done with the uh, with me catching the ball a little bit to show, you know, I didn't have uh, you know <laughs> break hands. Uh, I did some dunks and different things like that, and he just kind of commented on it. And it was one of those, you know, the big old VCR, the big camcorder deals yeah. and stuff like that back in the day. But it was, you know, it was just one of those things where trying to think outside the box and figure out a way. And then uh, um, I went to Liberty University out of high school um, and got a scholarship there. And then uh, to play football. To play football. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was a uh, uh, pretty strict school. And, you know, I got caught kissing on a girl. And, and so they, 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 they kicked me out, but I had the chance to go back there. And I said, you know, I, I got more, you know, I got more opportunity. You know, I had more freedom living with my parents than I did at, at, at school wow. living in the dorm, you know. And I said, I didn't want to. So I, I, I went and bought a book. On, I knew I could transfer to a junior college because I had redshirted. I knew I could transfer to a junior college and play the next year. And so I went and bought a book on junior colleges. And I picked out 150 junior colleges and and found ones that played football. And I, I I called each one of them, got their head coach's name, and sent them a letter. Wow, that and many? Yeah, 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 100, yeah. 150, yeah. somewhere in that. You so that so it was. It, I know it was at least 100. So I I did that. Uh, sent them a sent them a letter, and then you know a couple of them called me back. And Kilgore Junior College, Coach Miller, there, I'll forever be indebted to him. He calls me and says, well, I need some film, son. And I said, well, I don't have any film, but call these guys. And he called Jack, and he called uh, my high school coach. And the next day, he called back and gave me a scholarship. Man. 
So I don't know what Jack said to him. I still don't know what he said to him, yeah. but he lied to him, whatever he said. <laughs> <laughs> How so. huge was Jack, though, man? I mean, like, to, you know, talk about everything coming together for you just by chance playing in some kind of celebrity basketball game. Mm-hmm. You, you know, I, I just got to say the good Lord was looking out for me, and, and I was blessed uh, at the opportunity to, to, to meet Jack and have a guy that was willing to help some, some punk kid that just wandered in a gym. You know, he didn't know me from, from anything, but he was w- willing to. And, he, and he's done that for other kids and stuff. So, you know, uh, I refer, he's my big brother now, and, 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 and I love him. I have a, my kids call him Uncle Jack, and uh, a lot of affection for him and appreciate, you know, the influence he's had on my life. And, and, and there's other things. You know, it's not just football. You know, our relationship now is that, uh, you know, advice – you know, throughout life and throughout my career and different things like that and looking at his example. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a big help to me in life. So you get to Washington State, and here's what I, here's what I see. Coach Price eventually tells Jack Thompson, look, this guy is never going to play here, but I'm going to give him a scholarship because he's a good guy and we need a few of those, but I don't know where I'm going to play him. Like, I know you've heard that before. Like, when you hear it again, like, does it just kind of, like, make you wonder, you know, what what was going through the the mind of Coach Price at that point? Well, you know, I think there were some, maybe a couple guys that were were not exactly great locker room guys at the time at Washington State, and and, uh, he felt like he needed a couple of locker room guys. And, And, you know, from my perspective, all you can ever ask for in life is a chance. And as far as I was concerned, I didn't know his attitude was that at the time. But as far as I was concerned, I, I had a chance, you know. So you give me a chance, and and then it's on me to 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 do with it what I will. And uh, you know, I was gonna outwork guys, and I was gonna find a way. I I, I never thought I'd be an offensive lineman. Um, I remember at my junior college, I would look at the O line practicing, and they were practicing hard during practice. And I was playing linebacker at the time. We're doing seven on seven, you know. It's 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 kind of easy, you know, and yeah. we're not moving a sled and doing all that stuff. And then by the time I was at Washington State, you, you kind of you kind of see really where you fit with all these great athletes on the field and stuff like that. And, and offensive line looked pretty darn good to me. And, and you know, I, I, any football player has has the goal of playing the dream of any little kid on the playground has the dream of playing in the NFL someday. And I kind of knew, you know, in the back of my mind, well, my chance is right here. At, at offensive line, so when I got the opportunity to move over and play center and, and and guard at Washington State, I was I was really excited about it, and I felt like again I had a chance. Yeah. Well, how did you get that that chance? Like when you because you you know you running back in high school, you're linebacker, you kind of bo- bounced around to figure out where yeah. Robbie Toback was going to play. But how did you get that? Like, was there a guy who put his hand on your shoulder and said, "We need you to go over there"? Well, what happened was. Uh, Every position I played, you know, so when I was a running back, uh, I loved Earl Campbell, so I wanted to be a big running back. Yeah. And as soon as I became a big running back, they said, you know, you'd be a good linebacker. And as soon as I became a big linebacker, they said, you play, you can play D-line. <laughs> you know, so I kept, I kept, I don't know, I kept kind of growing out. And, and, and I loved to lift weights, and, and I was into the weight room and stuff, and I just kept getting bigger and stronger. And then I was playing D-line. Uh, I it finally moved down to D-line at Washington State. And I, I was playing there, and just, you know, my D-line coach was, I just didn't like him. No, well, actually, nobody liked him, but he was crazy. Um, and he calls me one day. I'm sitting, sitting there having lunch in my apartment. He calls me, hey, Coach Price is going to come visit you, and, you know, I, I need you at D-line. He's going to ask you to move to O-line because, they, you know, they need to replace this guy. And, and, but I, I, you got to tell him no. You got to tell him no. Right? I was like, all right, Coach. And I hang up. I'm like, man, I'm going to O-line right now. And so – Coach Price, Coach Price, you know, and, and this is this is the this is the type of, you know, Coach Price didn't send me a message and call me up to his office. He literally, this is the kind of guy he was. He drove to my apartment in the middle of the day because he thought, you know, well, I'm going to be upset about having to move to O line, you know, which. I don't even know why he cared. You know, I'm the player. I'm on scholarship. The guy tells me to go play O line. I'll go play O line, right? And uh, but that's the type of guy he was. And he, he comes in my apartment. And he's kind of yeah, you know, I would like you to play O line, man. And I got the inside. I've got the biggest smile I've ever had. You know, because I get and you know, Coach Yarno was there, um, and and Coach McDonnell were, were the O line coaches, and and I, I really knew that I, I really wanted to play for Coach Yarno. 
and and uh, uh, you know the stuff he taught me in a year and a half of playing offensive line at Washington State, I I used my entire NFL career. Really? Yeah. Man, well that that's cool. It, uh, see, people don't, people know Mike Price, especially us in the media. We're like, yeah, he's a cool guy. You know, he seems like a great guy. The interviews are always great, but from a player's perspective, like mm-hmm. it's really cool to hear that uh, you know. He was probably probably a lot like a father figure and, and did a lot of different things, huh? He did, uh, you know. And there's there's stories after there's story after story after story about him doing, you know, stuff like that. And you know, wasn't that you know the, you get this thing, you know, players coach, he, he's going to be easy on the players. He he wasn't easy on on the players, and he'd get after guys. And 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 there's accountability. There has to be accountability in an organization um, at, at every level. Um, but he, you know, he, you you did know he cared. And, and, he, and he cared about you, and, and if you were willing to work work hard, and for him, he was he was willing to give back, and and uh, he did that, and he did it over and over, um, uh, you know, throughout his time at Washington State and and his entire coaching coaching career. Do you ever remember him uh, just snapping, like got like like in practice at all, like? Some some guys just absolutely lose it. Um, he doesn't seem like a guy that would do that. But do you ever remember anything like that? Uh, you know, I, I don't remember him necessarily. Just you know, I was always dealing with Yarno yelling at me. So, <laughs> so man, the offensive line coaches, <laughs> even in my day, they're loud as ever, man. Oh yeah, and the D line guys are probably a little bit like that too. But man, I, that does not surprise me about Yarno. Yeah, well, no, Yarno was fiery, but again, a guy that that you knew loved you and and cared about you would. Uh, you know, was passion, you know, and, and that's what I love about, you know, I, I coached, coached my son in junior high a little bit and stuff like that. And I was loud, but it wasn't yelling at the kids. It was passion, yeah. you know, and, and Yarna was passionate. And, and I really love that. And the only time we really ever got like in my grill was a uh, one time he was fussing at me and, and I turned around and walked, walked away in practice. <laughs> <laughs> and, but but the, but the other part of him was there was one time we were playing Stanford and, and I was popping out and getting it was Ron George who was I ended up playing with in Atlanta we were rookies together but he was coming off the end and I kept getting him I kept blocking him and for some reason Yarno thought I wasn't getting out there getting to him and he's he's on me on the sidelines and so I you know there's only so much of that a guy takes right so I stand ah, you know and I, I lit into him you know and and words were said and stuff. And then after the game, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm the player. He's a coach, you know, whatever. You know, and so I went up to him and said, hey, you know, I apologize about blowing up on you. Don't you ever come to me and apologize. You know, you're a competitor and blah, blah, blah. And I love that. And this oh, and that. Wow. You know, and I – so, you know, I and kind of – Kind of said, oh, okay, you know. So then I, I never shut up after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the, that's one of the great personality traits for you, man. Tell me about uh, for a lot of people that don't know about Pullman, uh, what makes it such a great college town? I think when you're there, uh, that, that's it. You're you're there to go to school, and 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 um, I think that just a bond is formed because. You know, and I'm not knocking you dub here, but you go to UW and there's there's a million distractions and a million things to do and you can go your own way and there's commuter schools um, where, you know, people are coming back and forth and, and I think sometimes you don't have that bond. But when you're in Pullman, you're relying on your buddies, you're relying on your friends, you're, you're there together, you're doing things together, everything you do is together. Um, and you, I think you just form a bond that a, a lot of other schools you know, maybe don't have or don't have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to form that kind of bond. And, and, uh, plus, you know, I think, you know, a little bit the underdog. And so underdogs kind of, you know, uh, you know, we kind of stick together and we kind of rally together and, and do, the, and, and, you know, those types of things. So I think, I think when you combine all that, it just, uh, it just makes for that, that special thing that I think Pullman has. We had one of the, you know, a lot of college players will play in bowl games, but you were able to play in the Copper Bowl, win the Copper Bowl, Drew Blood. So, what was um what was Bledsoe like? Uh, <laughs> Bledsoe was a good dude. We ended up rooming together there for a little bit, and um, uh, y- you know he he was uh he was just a good dude. I mean, a good dude to hang out with. He you know he quarterbacks all have this thing. You know, all all good quarterbacks have ever been around, and and you've seen them come and go through here. You know, a bunch of guys, but but they all kind of have a thing. A certain thing about them, a certain confidence and inner confidence about them, and, and that I think you have to have to, to play that position and be a leader. And he certainly, he certainly had that. But he was also one of the guys, 
And one of the things I think Bledsoe doesn't get enough credit for, and throughout his career, he showed it in the NFL, is he's a tough son of a gun. You know, I don't, I don't give him credit for being tough, but yeah. face to face, but he was tough. You know, you, you remember when he was in New England, he had the, the broken finger with the pin in it on his throwing hand, and he doesn't miss a game. You know, uh, the thing he, the, the, the time he got hurt, uh, you know, when, when, when Brady, Tom Brady came in and, and took his place in New England. You know, he could have died from that, you know, with the, the, the injury that he had and stuff like that. But he was just a, he was a tough kid, uh, cared, um, uh, helped me out. He's actually the guy that taught me how to snap because when I had moved to offensive line my junior year, I played, I played guard. And, uh, and I knew, like, I got I to gotta play center next year and I got to learn how to snap. And so during seven-on-seven, seven, um, you know, I'd go snap to him. And he would, he taught me, he's actually the guy that taught me how to snap. Snap huh. football, yeah. I, people don't realize how much is goes into being a center because you are the quarterback of the offensive line, and you're you're calling a lot of the um, a lot of the way the defense sets up. But when you say it teaches you how to snap, was it turning the football, like bringing it back with the laces in the correct spot, like all yeah, that stuff? Yeah, how, how to how to turn the football, how to, you know what a quarterback you know wants, how how they you know uh, how they uh, you know like to get the ball. Um, you know, just you know, hitting a certain spot on my leg and, and where to put the ball, all those types of things. You know, it's, it, it, you know the football can't come up to the side, you know, all, you know, because the quarterback doesn't get it. It's got to be, even when you're stepping one way or the other, the quarterback, the, the ball's got to hit that same spot and stuff. And so he worked with me to say, you know, this, this is what he liked, this is what he needed. And, you know, throughout my career, I think, you know, most quarterbacks I've played with said, God, you know, the ball's just right there the whole time and, and stuff like that. But it all goes back to, to, to kind of learning it with him and, and walking through it and, and kind of critiquing every snap I would give him there for, for a couple months. You yeah, know? you know what? I got to give you a lot of credit because, I mean, like you said, you didn't snap a whole lot at all. No. Like you came out as a free agent and, you know, you, you sign on with the Falcons as a free agent mm-hmm. and it's like, yep. it, you know, you barely even snap, man. Yeah, you, know, you you turned that into a heck of a career after really only doing it for one year at Washington State. Yeah, well, you know, and other guys have done that, um, but again, you know, it was all about opportunity. So uh, I, I got the opportunity with the Falcons, and and they gave me a shot, and I was going to do what I had to do or could do um, to make that football team and and make that practice squad the first year, and and. You know, it came down really to to, and this is Coach Arno told me when when you go to camp, you 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 need to be the first guy. They're gonna have a bunch of rookies there. They're gonna keep one of you. You need to be the first guy to learn your plays, and you need to cover. You need to hustle. Always hustle. And I said, I can do that. You know. So the first preseason game we're playing the Miami Dolphins. Uh, we go. I go in in the fourth quarter. Of all the, they told us they had six or eight of us rookies. They said we're gonna keep one of you guys on practice squad. So there, wow. there's your odds right there. I was the only one of the, I think maybe one other guy got to play. And it, I got in the game because I knew the plays, and the coach could put me in without getting somebody killed. And so I got in the game. A, I knew the plays. The coach Arno again, and then cover downfield. I covered down, you know, and I had a couple mental errors, you know, <laughs> but what I did do was I remember a bear, he throw, he's throwing the football and I see the guy breaking on it and I know it's a pick. So I start running and I ended up, but on film, it looks like I ran this DB down and tackled him. But I had, I had started running like, you know, a few seconds before he did. And I took the angle and I got this guy saved a touchdown. And I remember watching film, uh, that next week and Glanville's our head coach. He doesn't even know my name. And we're watching film as a team, just kind of hustle plays and stuff like that. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. He's saying, this guy, this guy. You know? And I'm sitting in my chair going, yes. You know? Uh, And then my coach told me after that, he goes, keep it up, man. That's, you know, you did did good for yourself. Keep it up. But that's cool. you're, you're, You're watching a play develop, and you know as soon as it leaves the quarterback's arm that it's going to be picked. Like, is that something you just pick up as an instinct? I mean, your anticipation? Well, I, you know, I just saw him break. You know, I saw the guy break on the ball, and I could see he was going to get there. You, know, you could just see it, you know. And, and so I, I started running, you know. And of course, it's a DB. He could have always dropped it. You yeah. Know? That's, that's, that's why he's a DB. Right? <laughs> All right. So in, in nine of your 14 seasons, you played every game. 
All right. Um, for, if, if my research is correct, uh, and in, I think in, you only missed one game in 10 seasons, um, and you played 14, but still, in, at that position to stay that healthy, um, how difficult is that? Because that's kind of like you got to be smart too. Well, uh, you got to be smart, but you know, I never felt I was in a position to let another guy have a chance. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I didn't. You know, I didn't like to miss practice. I didn't like to miss because you know, uh, NFL. They're they're you know, hey, oh gosh, you're great. Now, if we can find somebody that's better than you, we'll get rid of your ass and, and take that guy. Yeah. You know, so um, and it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, um, so, but you know, I was just fortunate. I remember. Uh, Going into the, our Super Bowl year, we had a, I don't even remember who it was, asked, kind of asked, came up and asked me one day, what's your secret to playing so long? I was like, man, I just, part of it's just kind of being lucky. I have stayed healthy and, and you know, you got you to gotta take care of yourself and stay healthy and, you know, but part of that's just kind of luck. And he goes, you know, that's what Chris Gray just said to me. It's the same <laughs> exact thing that Chris Gray said because, we, you know, we're the same year. Um, and, you know, it, it's like, you know, I look at my son Mason. You know, Mason trained hard. He was in shape. He worked his tail off. You know, he did the right things. Um, he's unlucky. Yeah. You know, he got hurt. You know, and it's just, it's just, he had all the heart and everything you could ask for. It just, you know, it's it's just dumb luck sometimes. Yeah. And, and injuries are. Um, but, you know, if you can stay healthy and, 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 and also have a, uh, have a reason for him to keep you, you know, um, you know, don't give them a reason to to look the other look at the other guy. You know, never take for granted. You know, the great players I played with, the Hall of Famers I'm talking about. You know, Walter Jones. He didn't he didn't come to training camp. That was a contract deal. But but once he was there, he did he practiced every day and he worked hard. Um, you know, Jerry Rice was here. He's an old man when he was here. But first guy out to practice, John Randall out to practice. You know, first guy out to practice, Chris Dolman. You know, I played with him in Atlanta. You know. Uh, Clay Matthews, uh, senior in Atlanta. You know, I played with him when he was 17 years in the league. But, but you know, these guys were pros. And and if you watch the great ones, they don't. The great ones don't take time off. And and the the great ones are lunchbox guys. So if the great ones are lunchbox guys, then I'm gonna be a lunchbox yeah. guy, right? Yeah, well, that's that's a great attitude and uh, really great advice for the younger guys trying to make the team. But. Um, Take me back to 96 when you, you scored the touchdown. You know, your stats that year were, I think, uh, two catches, 15 <laughs> yards, and a touchdown. Oh, man. What, what, how in the, was that a Glanville thing? I don't know. You know was no, it, Yeah, we, so June Jones, our head coach, and uh, Mitch Lyons was our tight end. We, we were in the run-and-shoot offense. Um, uh, a Bears, the quarterback. So Mitch Lyons is our tight We got one tight end on the roster. And, and I'm starting at left guard. And Mitch – we, so we're playing the Steelers that week. We had, we're, we're using our tight end. That's the biggest part of our game plan. This is the deal. We're going to do this this week. And Mitch shows up to the stadium on Sunday, and he can't even walk. He's got back spasms so bad. He can't. His, his like body's like contorted sideways. He can't do anything. And and we're going, you know, great. You know, this is our whole game plan, and the guy's freaking laid up. And June comes up to me before the game and says, hey. And he had drawn up some plays and said, you're playing tight end. When we go blue today, you're playing tight end. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I kind of learned the plays. And, and first play of the game, I'm at left guard. Then, then, then we go blue. Jeff Palcoa, former Husky, um, comes in at left guard. I go to tight end. And, and we go all the way down the field on the Steelers. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down the field. And we get down to the goal line. And A Bear calls a play, and I'm going, that wasn't on my, that route wasn't on my sheet, you know? And so I go, Bobby, what do I do? And, <laughs> and, and uh, he says, he goes, just go to the corner, I'm, you know, because that Cajun, you know, yeah, accent right. he had. And so, all right. And so I, I, I'll never forget, I'm in my stance going, okay, do I, do I, do I fake like I'm going to block and then go, or do I go immediately? What do I do, you know? And so I kind of block down like, you know, like, oh, I'm blocking. And then <laughs> I snuck out. I snuck out. Well, you know, the Steelers completely ignored me. And they all jump on Jamal Anderson, who's running to the, to the, to the piling at the front of the end zone. And so I'm wide open in the back of the end zone. And I, the ball's coming at me. Abraham looks at me and throws the ball. And I go, oh, crap. I'm in. I, I, it, it's all slow motion. I'm thinking, 
while the ball's in the air, I'm thinking, oh, crap, I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> no, he threw that to me. I'm going to go ahead and catch it. You know, and I, and I caught the ball, and and then I went crazy. You know, it's like, because I never never expected that. It wasn't like, hey, we got the, you know, we got the play in, the special play in or anything like that. It was just one of those deals, and, you know, my Lyman buddies are jumping on yeah, me. We're man. all excited. Chris Berman gave me a Robbie Toe Beck, 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 <laughs> you know, nickname. So that was kind of cool. And then the, the next, so then it's like, okay, well, we're going with Tobeck at tight end. And, you know, Mitch is one of my buddies, you know, you know, so, but you, you do what you do. And, and so later in the year, we're playing the Saints and Mark Fields, who was my teammate at Washington State, out is a linebacker there and a great, great guy. Love the guy, you know, but, and, and we'd play against each other twice a year and, and we'd talk a little smack and stuff like that. And his opening line was always, Tobek, you've been eating well, you know, you know <laughs> that, that deal, but. But so I'm, I'm at tight end and he's kind of playing off me, ignoring me a little bit. And we call this play and I'm out in the flat and I'd ran this play all week, never got the ball. All of a sudden in the game, ball's coming my way. And so I'm going to catch it. And most guys catch the ball and turn up the sideline, right? You know, the momentum takes them this way. But, you know, those old running back instincts came in and I knew, I knew Fields was coming. And so I catch the ball and I turn back inside. And when I do, he, he kind of misses me, he hits me and falls down. And I turn up the field and I, and I see nothing but green and nothing but green. So I'm thinking, I, man, I turn the Jets, what I thought were the Jets. I turn them on and I'm thinking, man, I've got a 40 yard touchdown here, right? I'm going to kill it, right? And within 14 yards, 10 yards, whatever it was, <laughs> Fields had fallen down, rolled, gotten back up, caught me along with about six other dudes. I got this great picture of me, like everyone's like there's five guys on me. I've got I've got the ball. But you know, it shows you how how athletic and uh, Fields was that he was able to fall down, roll, get up and still catch me within 10 yards. Wow. You man. know, I mean, he was just uh, you know, freak athlete. But man. you must have some cool stuff like you talk about that picture. Do you have video of um of the uh, touchdown? Like, do you have video oh, somewhere? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's <clears throat> like, you know, that's must-see around yeah, here. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got to get it all converted to a digital deal and everything. I still got it on videotape, actually. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was, um, you know, and, and the NFL does a, a cool thing for players is they do their, their uh, the, the NFL films will do your highlights. Now, I don't have a lot of highlights because I was an offensive lineman for my career, but you know that's on there. They show some stuff, they show some plays and different things like that, and so it was kind of cool. I got that. My wife got ordered that for me last yeah. year. And stuff. What a great so, idea! Well, yeah, it was I didn't great. know they it's did a, that. It's a nice perk. That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, you got to show me that pick for sure. That's really funny. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's move to the Seahawks. I mean, um, I will. I will. I want to ask you about Super Bowl Thirty Three. You know, you guys lose to the Broncos. A thirty-four nineteen, um, that probably was a compare that Super Bowl experience with the one you had with the Seahawks. Is were there a lot of parallels? Those seasons were parallels. Um, <clears throat> Eighteen hundred yard rushers, uh, quarterbacks had you know career years, uh, great years. Defenses both kind of bend but don't break. Uh, um, records were the same. Um, you know no one gave us a chance that whole thing um very very similar years and and uh just uh, both both super bowls we had great weeks of practices you know when i was both in atlanta and here great weeks of practice but we didn't handle the the other stuff as as well as we should have you know we had in 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 atlanta we had the whole dog collar thing with with you know Buchanan and Sharp, and then you had the the deal with um, um, Eugene Eugene the night before the Super Bowl and stuff, and then here you know we had the you know um, you know the the, the the trash with talk with Stevens. Porter and Stevens yep. and all that stuff, and it's stuff you just don't need, you know, because it the the distraction. It, 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 there's such a fine line. The the intensity of of of, of the playoffs. You know, the regular season is super intense in football. It's different than other. That's one of the things that makes it great. Other sports, 
the Mariners lose tonight, they play the same team again tomorrow night. You know? And you kind of, okay, you, you box this one, you move on. With football, it, 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 you lose a game, it's a week of misery until you get an op- another opportunity to win a game. It, and if you, you know, it just is. Uh, you know, it's just a week of misery if, when you lose a football because they mean so much. There's only 16 of them. And then in the playoffs, the first round's intense, even more intense than the regular season. Even though you, somehow you're given 100% effort in the regular season, it just, the intensity grows and you can feel it. You've been to the stadium and the playoffs, you feel it. It comes down from the stands, you feel it. And the Super Bowl is so intense and there's such a fine line in every football game, but it's even more magnified in the Super Bowl. And I just didn't think we handled those situations uh, as well as we could have as a team. Um, you know, that being said, and the refs screwed us in, in the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. season, so. <laughs> <laughs> there were some calls, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm just a football fan, but watching as a, as a fan, you know, like, there were some calls. You look, look back and you're just like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, the one that blows me away was, was when Hasselbeck gets called for – what was it blocking from behind or something yeah, when the, the when, or something. Yeah, when yeah. he's like, when he's trying when it was an interception he's just guy. trying to make a tackle yeah like, I, what I are you how do you even make that up yeah. uh, I don't want to get you going on there, that there's a few of them I just remember during the game that running onto the field we had a long punt return and then there was a flag I remember during the game it's like dang every time we make a play there's a flag I just remember thinking that during the game and then that's kind of all there all there was to it but but it's just, you know, they're momentum killers. But that's one of the things all year long we had been able to overcome that stuff. And, you know, we didn't. Yeah. We didn't that game. Yeah. What about uh, – you You were always my go-to guy at training camp, but I think you, you, you started to sense that guys were coming to you. When you had, used to train over in Cheney and uh, there were two a days and it was a different kind of deal than it is today, of course. But um, did you kind of like uh, – you? You know, there was a time where your wife always said you came home with great stories and there's like, are you a guy that just revels in that kind of stuff where you like to, you know, even as a player at lunch, you know, you were mm-hmm. you were telling stories and um, it, there's a lot of truth to that, but what a great characteristic it was, or, you know, character trait. Well, well you, you just don't, what you get from football, you just don't get it anywhere else. You don't. I mean, um, the guys... Uh, the talk, the stories, the the uh, the blending of personalities and backgrounds and everything you just you just don't get it anywhere else but the locker room and and it it just uh, that's 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 one of the things I miss so much is is just being able to you know you know I, I talked to Hutch last night Hutch and I could argue and say whatever we want to each other but still go out and have a beer that night, you oh. know, or, or what, you know, and it's just, I just loved, I just, I just loved being around the guys. And because, you know, I, outside of football, I got maybe two guys like that, yeah. you know, two of my fishing buddies that I can, I can talk to the same or joke around the same and you're not worried about it, you know, offending or worried about people, you know, it's just, it's just great. And, and, uh, you miss that. And, and, I, a lot of people would say, well, you know, Tobek was funny. I wasn't necessarily a joker or anything. I was just more of a kind of a, you know, maybe a wise ass or whatever, you know, but, but, you know, or popping off or, you know, those types of things. But it's just, it was fun. You know, it was, it was just a lot of fun being around, being around the guys. No, but you're right. You, you, I don't think you as you were as a, a jokester. I thought more of you as just a guy who spoke his mind and, and, um, you know, if you were if you were pointing in the right direction, you had no problem going down that road. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember asking you about some of the strongest guys on the team, and and Chris Gray was one of those guys, and and uh, you had some funny things to say about him, and it was Grant Wistrom. It's another thing. Mm-hmm. Walt says you're an instigator. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I know you may have heard some of his comments, but it's like, like how much of that is true that you you were an instigator? Well, you know, I guess a little bit. That's true. Um, because I would be the one to, to pop off and say something always, you know, like, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I like to give our strength coach a bad time, those types of things. But I, I instigated within within my limits when it came to, you know, authority coaches or whatever, Coach Holmgren or whatever. You know, I, I felt like there's certain things that, you know, maybe I could say to Coach Holmgren that, that maybe another guy couldn't. But I, but I knew that limit, too, yeah. you know. Um, but with, with what Walt's talking about is – you know, it used to just drive me crazy that we'd be in the middle of a football game 
we'd be wearing someone out. And Walt's trashing this dude the entire game or Hutch or whoever. And all of a sudden, this D-line, it's third quarter. We've already got him beat. And this guy wants to start running his mouth. And it's just like, you know, shut up. <laughs> you know? You're getting tore up. You know? You're getting... You know, but, you know, the, the guys like to say I always did it to their guy, not the guy. But there was a couple where I, I you know, and I, I knew this question was coming after last <laughs> week. But there was a couple. I remember we were playing the Browns one time. We got the Browns worn out. And, and they had a pretty good uh, nose guard. Um, and and I, for, I forgot his name, but pretty good nose guard. And, you know, dude, it's fourth quarter. We we beat them. The game is over. And we throw the ball down. And we're we're about to go in and score. And this guy, so I'm set in the huddle, and this guy comes walking through our huddle like <laughs> tough guy. <laughs> yeah. And so I had words. You know, he's he's trying to punk. You know, and you we're on the football field. You're not going to do that, right? And so I freaking I I went after him and let him know what I thought about it and this and that. So next play, he's lined up on me and he he wants to get me. So I snapped the ball, boom, and I locked him up real quick. And, and so I was like, you, ain't, you know, what are you going to do? You ain't going anywhere. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and I was trashing him, and he got mad and just, bam, and just punched me. He grabbed my face mask and punched me right in the chin, right uppercut, right in the that. chin, yeah. But the ref was like right there. And I go, oh, you saw it. You saw it. You got to kick him out. You got to kick him out. <laughs> and the ref throws a flag and kicks him out of the game and stuff like that. But, but you know, it, it I, it just used to drive me crazy when I knew Walt or Hutch or Chris, you know, a guy was getting worn out or a guy wanted to be a tough guy, you know. We're all tough guys out there, you know. You got to be a tough guy. And, you know, you know, quit running your mouth and line up and play. Let's play football, you know. And, and guys that never said it, you know, that's why one of the reasons I respected Bryant Young for uh, the 49ers so much because um, he was a great player, great, great player. And I, and I think he should be a Hall of Famer someday, but – but great player. And, and when I was in Atlanta, the Niners would wear us out. And he would never say a word. And then when I was here at the Hawks, we would wear them out. And he would ne- he never said a word. He just put his hand down and played football and, and played hard. And wow. you, better bring your, you better bring it when you play against him. And even when he got older. You know, he was just a great player. And so I always had a lot of respect for guys like that that just played football, you know. Yeah. Who, who was the toughest guy you ever had to go against? Do you, could you put your finger on it? Um... Well, I tell you what, uh, Leon Lett, before his first, the only guy I ever, there's probably two guys I lost sleep over. <laughs> uh, Leon Lett, um, the first time uh, he, before he got suspended the first time. You know, once he got suspended and he came back, he had a couple of suspensions there. He never was the same. He kind of lost his legs, got a little older and stuff. But before he got suspended that first time, you know, I remember we're playing a charity basketball game. It's 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 the Falcons versus the Cowboys in the off season, and I'm covering this guy, and he's six eight, shoulders like bowling balls, freaking long arms, and I'm thinking, man, I gotta block this guy this this year. And so as we're watching film that week, he's literally killing guys. I mean, locking guys out and putting them on their knees and running over. I mean, just I I've never I literally have never seen it anything like it. Hmm. And, and, uh, and I'm just going, holy cow, man. And I knew I'm going to be singled up on him the whole game. I'm just going, man, this is going to be. And so the night before the game, our, our center, I was playing left guard, our center at the time, Roman Fortin, says to June, our head coach, June Jones, says, says uh, man, Leon Les is killing guys this year. And, and June says, you know, I'm not worried about him. We got Toback on him. Toback will just scrap with him the whole game, just fight him. I said, okay, I can do that. I can, I can be scrappy. And so I, I, I literally had, I had a really good game other than one play where he got into me on a draw. I kind of set light. Man, he put his hands on me. And now his hands are longer than mine. So if he got his hands on me before I got mine on his, I couldn't reach him. And, man, I'm walked back. <laughs> I'm walking back. I'm all high. And I literally saw the handoff <laughs> on a draw, you know, five yards deep in the end zone. But the beauty of it was, was he he knocked me back so fast that there was a he couldn't make the play because we were past it, yeah. and the hole was huge because <laughs> there was no one there anymore. It ended up being a good play, but and John Randall, John Randall was uh, was a beast. He he just was in his prime when he was in Minnesota and stuff. He was great here too, but but um, 
he was a beast and yeah. and but he was one of the guys that you know he would never shut up but you kind of knew that about him and it wasn't but he would start it at the beginning of the game he wasn't one of those guys that would start in the third quarter you know but wouldn't he do it in practice too like like would he do it in practice i remember watching you guys at cheney and 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 randall had this motor that was nonstop, and, and he was a veteran, when he, you know, super mm-hmm. veteran, all pro guy when he comes to the Seahawks at his point in his career. But I remember him just just never taking a break, like stepping up the one on one drills. Mm-hmm. How difficult was it in those things where you're just like, dude? Well, you know, I, you know, I never had to go against him in one on ones, uh, you know, being at, at center. But I used to. It, this is where you really found the. Res- he didn't talk a lot of trash, you know, in practice and stuff like that, but. The respect for Hutch and him, and you got two All Pros, and going at each and, and and Hutch is ultra competitive, and you know John Randall is. Hutch is a little more quiet about it, but both very very competitive, and you know if one of them won a battle, they had to line up and go again. Hmm. You know, and uh, it, it 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 was it was fun to watch those two guys. In that drill, because that's that's a tough drill for for an offensive lineman anyway. But but Hutch Hutch took a lot of pride in in, in what, the product he put out there, and it was fun watching those battles. And you know, a lot of people didn't pay attention to it, and nobody watches the O lines down there doing you know doing one on ones during seven on seven. It's not the it's not the beauty pageant that the seven on seven is, but but those were those were fun battles to watch because you know that it would just kill either one of them if one of them felt like I really got bested today yeah um uh, but the thing we used to do with randall this is a funny story is randall could not let you think that you got him ever (laughs) he could not lose right and so even in saturday walkthrough saturday morning walkthrough where you're you know you don't even you don't even put your hands on anybody right he would be fine and he would walk through but as soon as you put your hand on his chest Boom, wham! I mean, he would. I mean, he couldn't handle it, and he would just go faster. So on Saturday morning walkthrough, we would always just put our hand on his chest, and it would drive like we're, I'm blocking you, and it would drive him absolutely crazy. And he'd he'd just about break your forearm when you do that, but it was hilarious. We'd do stuff like that, and it's hilarious. Yeah, as a as a group of old linemen. You guys are like the biggest family within the family. I mean, you guys, exactly. you know, yeah. it's a tightly knit group. So I'm sure you guys are sitting back there just going, watch this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We used to love doing that. We used to love doing that stuff. And, you know, you have a lot of inside jokes as as, as offensive linemen. And and you because you, you are you are a group, you know, a family with, within that family. So. Yeah. What, when you look at the two-a-days now or two-a-days back then to compare to the, the way the CBA has these guys practicing now, can you imagine like playing in this age of football where you go to practice in the morning and maybe some meetings and hang out and, yeah, and have some lunch? <laughs> I, mean, I know it's more than that, but to watch you guys work in Cheney where special teams in the afternoon was considered your your off day, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, man, that, it's crazy where it is now. What, what these guys got now is it was always the dream. Yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> always the dream. Um, uh, uh Somebody told me a stat one time that 48% of all your practice, back when I played, 48% of all your practice for the year were done in training camp. And so that's a lot of mileage that maybe, you know, maybe the body doesn't need. Now, I think guys need, you know, guys need to hit a little bit. You need reps, you know, and I think the it, it, it's taken the, the league and the coaches a little bit of time to maybe figure that out. Because I thought a couple of years ago, the quality of play to start the season wasn't what, what it should have been and I think you do need reps and you do need practice and you do need those things and I think guys need to play a little bit in the preseason um you know I don't know that everyone needs to play a lot but but I think you need to play a little bit in the preseason because I think you need I don't I don't think you need four preseason games necessarily but I think if you if you knock that down to three or two or you know two especially guys need to play a little bit and get ready because the live bullets are it's just different and the bullets are firing faster, and that's just the way it is. And, and uh, um, but yeah, it would be nice. You know, good for these guys. You know, it's it's like I tell guys. The other thing is, you know, you can't help when you're born. You know, but I look at that salary cap nowadays. And when I was a rookie, it was the first year for the salary cap. I think the salary cap was like thirty 
30 or 36 million. It, it wasn't more than 36 million. I just, I know that. I think it was 36 million. And now it's what, 150 or 136 yeah. or whatever it is. Right. That's 100 million plus more. You know, and I just go, gosh, darn it. You know, could I, I wish I could have been like, you know, 15 years younger or something. <laughs> but, but good for these guys. Yeah. It's different. I mean, these guys. Did they ever have a limited on your pad practices when you're like, especially in your Holmgren days, where, because um, now you these guys only get 14 pad practices throughout the entire season, mm-hmm. and the first, and you have to have 11 of them in the first 11 weeks or whatever. So basically, that the back third, you're only practicing with pads three times. So um, back when you were with Holmgren and those, you know, during those days, because that's the one that really sticks out to me. You guys busting your butts. It's 100 degrees in Cheney, and and I think, were there times where he said, you're going to put your pads on and we're going to go again in the afternoon? Would you ever have back-to-back pad practices because you guys um, stunk it up? See, I always thought, pra- <clears throat> see, Holmgren camp to me was great. Because in Atlanta, it was twice as hot, twice as humid. Um, I, I had three days one year in Atlanta. Three yeah. days. Um, and, you know, and then I had Dan Reeves, who we, we'd pad up on Friday during the season. <laughs> so, I mean, when I got to Holmgren and, you know, you knew you had every other afternoon off and, you know, the, the one day after, the, you know, I thought, man, this is great. You know, I could do this. Okay. And then, uh, but uh, there were times where Mike, he, he wouldn't necessarily say, we're coming back and we're doing it. But there were times where he would just, he'd want to, he'd want to prove a point or do something. And he'd, I remember goal line one time. Goal line, you know, drill. The, the D line just hunkered down like crazy, and we're not getting any movement. It's a, go again, go again, go. You know, and he's looking, and the whole time he's looking in the huddle to see who's like going to get mad or pissed yeah. off about it. Well, I was like, well, I'm mad and pissed off. I'll say something, you know. So, you know, and he's kind of looking at me like, what are you going to do, you know? And so. You know, he made us take all, you know, all the reps, you know, as, as the first group and the other groups didn't get, you know, but, you know, he'd do stuff like that sometimes, but, but I, I thought he was always pretty fair. And you knew like, once you got in the season, like the first eight weeks, you're going to be padded up. And then after that, you're going to go, we would drop down to our shells and stuff like that. And so, so, and he was, he was pretty good about it. Boy, I, I thought that was great. Okay. So, yeah. so Cheney was nothing compared to Atlanta and Dan Reeves and some of those things. Yeah. Atlanta was... Yeah, that that was that was tougher. Yeah, I'll, I'll say. <laughs> I remember I remember Eric Dickerson was in Atlanta for just a just a minute, you know, his his last year, and and you know Eric Dickerson's never been touched in practice, you know, since he was a rookie. You you boy, he's he's the golden child. You don't touch him, yeah. right? <clears throat> and he comes to Atlanta and Glanville, and we were going nine on seven. He ran in. <laughs> They ran the first snap, and guys are like, wham, 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 wham. He's like, what the heck is this, man? This ain't how it's supposed to go. But, you know, crazy. Man, but even those times, like even even all that, those brutal two-a-days and all those years from college to pro, like you you definitely, you would do it all over again, huh? In a heartbeat. Yeah. In a heartbeat. You know, I, I love to fish. And, you know, if, and that's, I, I love to do it. I you know, I love watching my boys play football when they were playing. I love all that stuff. I love watching the games now. I'm still a football junkie, but nothing nothing replaces uh, running out of that stadium. On, on Facebook, I have my banner is 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 a picture somebody took from above us as as we're coming out, and it's Hasselback and me and and a couple and Hutch and a couple guys, and we're just kind of standing around milling to wait our turn to go out, and that's the moment for me that that you know you feel the intensity from the crowd it's time you've put a week into preparation for this this three hours six or you know i guess it's technically 60 minutes but battle on sunday out up there on the field and you're ready to go you know and and, uh that's the moment and and you that's what you can't replace that and that feeling of of winning that game at the end of the game when you're looking across a guy and you're kneeling the ball down. I mean, yeah. those, those two things are those, you, I just don't know where else you get it. 
Listen, man, I could I could listen to you talk and tell stories all day, man. It's it's been a, a pleasure to visit with you and, and listen to some of the things from your past and uh, just so many great stories. And I know you have a vault of them, so I'm hoping that someday we can do this again and 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 dig a little deeper into this thing because uh, it sure has been great listening to it. Well, I appreciate that, and yeah, I'd love to love to get together sometime. It's always good to get together with you. All right, Robbie, so, thanks a lot. Yeah, see you.